All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending upon where you're joining us from. Uh, my name is uh, Damon Hernandez, and I'd like to welcome you to the WebGL and WebGPU Meetup Fall Edition of uh, 2021. Uh, we have uh, quite a great uh, lineup today, so we're going to go ahead and jump right in. Uh, so this is our uh, third, I believe, meetup for the year. And again, I'll go ahead and be your host. We'll get the WebGL update from uh, Mr. Ken Russell coming up next. Then we're going to hear from uh, Ivan with Crazy Panda about some of the work that he's doing. Um, Microsoft will share with us a little bit about uh, Babylon JS and, and some of the cool things they're doing for WebGPU. And then we'll hear from Esri. So uh, don't forget, all of your questions put in the Q&A. If you drop them into the chat, we will not be able to get to them. So make sure you drop any questions that you have for any, any of our presenters into the question and answer, and we'll make sure to get to that uh, time permitting at the end of our presentation. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over uh, to you, Mr. Ken, uh, if you want to grab the screen and go ahead and get us started with our WebGL fall update. Super cool. Thanks, Damon. Hello, everybody. Let me get this started. Okay. Let's see. Is that working? Uh, it says you have. Yes. You're good okay. to go. Super. All right, so um, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to our combined WebGL and WebGP meetup. And uh, I will uh, give some updates on behalf of both the WebGL working group and WebGPU community group. So we've got a, a packed agenda and let's dive right in. So the first item is I wanna encourage everyone to join the WebGL and WebGPU communities. Both of these APIs are supported by vibrant online communities. And if you're developing with either of these two APIs, we would love to hear from you. So on the WebGL side, please consider joining the WebGL dev list. Any announcements of products, demos, new tools, job postings, questions, discussions, everything is welcome here. Kronos's public WebGL mailing list offers lower traffic announcements. And also uh, you can feel free to ask spec questions, et cetera, you know, ask about bugs there but the WebGL dev list does, I think, have broader reach. There's a WebGL matrix chat room that Mozilla set up, and this offers a way to talk with browser implementers and other developers. You can also find a lot of cool stuff by searching the WebGL hashtag on Twitter. On the WebGPU side, if you have feedback on the API, please see the main WebGPU GitHub repository for options on how to communicate it to the community group. There's a WebGP matrix chat room as well, which offers, a, an, a, again, a way to talk with both browser implementers and other developers. And there's an increasing amount of cool stuff showing up on the WebGPU hashtag on Twitter. So uh, both APIs uh, groups look forward to hearing from you. Now, the updates that you've all been waiting for. WebGL2 in Safari. Well, Hopefully you've already heard the news, but WebGL2 has actually shipped in Safari 15 on both macOS and iOS. Uh, please cue the applause. This is the culmination of, a, over, of an over two year journey that started in June, 2019. And there were many positive outcomes from this joint project. The most significant is that WebGL2 can now be considered universally available across browsers, operating systems, and devices. And as an application author, you can target WebGL2 with confidence. WebGL version two has resolved many corner cases and behavioral differences among platforms compared to the combination of WebGL1 and its many extensions. And we strongly encourage you to migrate to WebGL2. It's no longer necessary for you to maintain a WebGL1 fallback path unless you need to reach absolutely every device. And in particular, we're talking here about older Windows machines and Android devices. But by and large, you can basically just target WebGL2 and expect your content to run in a user's hands. Some other positive outcomes. <clears throat> Apple has adopted Angle as the basis for Safari's WebGL implementation. 
and Apple's team made dramatic contributions to Engel's metal backend over a period of over a year. Safari 15 is running WebGL on top of metal on all recent iOS and macOS devices. And Apple's and Google's engineering teams are collaborating on many items. For example, upstreaming Apple's work to the Engel repository, which is going very well, passing the underlying OpenGL ES2 and 3 conformance tests, which affect WebGL. We're addressing key functionality issues, like the ability to access the discrete GPU on dual GPU MacBook Pros, and adopting top of tree angle back into WebKit so that both companies have a common code base for development going forward. We're also working on switching Chrome to use Engel's metal backend. As always, file any bugs that you see in WebGL2 and Safari on bugs.webkit.org under the component WebGL. We'll see them, we'll triage them, and we'll get to them. And for filing uh, bugs against other browsers, consult the how to get a WebGL implementation page on the WebGL wiki. Uh, now I'd like to share a couple of uh, interesting upcoming WebGL extensions that may be relevant to you and your applications. The first is the draw buffers indexed extension. This enhances the ability to, to attach multiple uh, color attachments to your frame buffer. So basically rendering G buffers or something in one, uh, one render pass. Now this extension provides the ability to enable or disable blending, set the blend equations, set blend functions, set color right masks, all per color output. And this extension was specifically requested by Kronos's 3D formats working group in order to implement advanced materials and specifically those that use dual depth peeling more efficiently. The extension can be tested in Chrome today by enabling WebGL draft extensions in the About Flags page. And please file any bugs that you see on crbug.com and uh, do try to communicate them to us in some way by like emailing the WebGL dev list and saying, I filed this bug against this extension. We, uh, uh, this extension will come to all browsers shortly after it's community approved. Another pair of uh, very interesting extensions are the base vertex base instance extension and the multi-draw variation. So these finally provide to WebGL control over the base vertex parameter for indexed draw calls and base instance parameter for instance draw calls and multi-draw variants of both of these are provided as well. Now, what these let you do is reuse index buffers to draw multiple different geometries from the same set of vertex buffers and they reduce CPU and memory overhead in certain scenarios. If you've needed these draw parameters, and trust me, you know if you need them, uh, we just had a discussion on the WebGL dev list last month about a uh, Minecraft uh, clone that, that absolutely needs these for efficient rendering, then please try out these extensions and provide us your feedback. Again, these can be tested in Chrome today by turning on draft extensions in the about flags. Uh, please file any bugs that you see there. And the, this, these two extensions also will come to all browsers very shortly after community approval. They've been in development in all browsers for quite some time and the conformance tests are pretty much ready to go. Now let's switch tracks a bit and give you some updates on WebGPU. Excuse me. So the specification discussions among browser implementers are converging well. And we're all aiming for a 1.0 version of the specification uh, sometime early in 2022. Now today, you can try the API and all of the graphics and compute functionality that it offers in multiple browsers. In Chrome Canary, you can enable unsafe web GPU in the About Flags page. And in Firefox Nightly, you can set the DOM web GPU enabled uh, setting to true in About Config. But these are really intended for local development, and we advise you to not browse the open web with these flags enabled. Also, please keep in mind that implementations are still evolving very quickly, and content that you write might not be portable among browsers yet. We suggest that you always target the latest version of the WebGP specification in your apps when you're writing them. And if you find that your desired browser has quite caught up to the current version of the spec, ask about what might have been deprecated 
uh, or you know what the historical way to do the functionality uh, that you're aiming for is, and polyfill it if you're if the browser doesn't quite support the absolute top of tree spec. That will ensure the longevity of the code that you write. Oops. Now, another exciting piece of news is that the WebGPU spec has in fact advanced to the point where it's ready for broader testing. And if you're developing a WebGPU app, you can now publish it in such a way that users can access it without needing to enable flags in their browser via a Chrome origin trial. A recent web.dev article has given instructions on how to set up a, an origin trial key on your own website for publishing your, your apps in such a way. The origin trial is running from now, which is Chrome 94, to Chrome 97, which will be uh, shipping in about January 2022. And please keep in mind that the, the API will change incompatibly during the origin trial. This is really by design. We didn't want applications to make an assumption about an early version of the API now and not be able to, uh, to hold up that guarantee going forward. So please only publish content and, and advertise it if you plan to keep it up to date. Now, several really cool WebGL, WebGPU samples, excuse me, have been published to help you get started learning both the API and the shading language, uh, WIGSL or the WebGPU shading language. Austin Eng's WebGPU samples, and by the way, these links you can click uh, on, the, uh, on the presentations that hopefully have been sent out to all of the attendees already. Uh, these take you on journeys from your first triangle all the way through real world mixed compute and graphics examples. Brandon Jones clustered shading and metaballs demos show real world usage of the WebGPU API and compute shaders combined, including geometry generation on the GPU, which is really cool. Uh, and Shrek Shao's WebGPU deferred renderer shows how to do deferred shading in WebGPU, complete with debug views that actually show you how the algorithm works. It's really cool, so go check it out. Additionally, Babylon.js and 3.js, the two most popular libraries for accessing WebGL, already have WebGPU renderers well underway. And we're gonna hear more details from the Babylon.js team later in this meetup. So we've got a great group of presenters today. Uh, Ivan is going to show us how to do stroked lines in WebGL with top performance and high quality. Thomas from Microsoft is going to take us on the journey of porting Babylon.js to WebGPU and show some awesome demos. And Tam from Esri is going to show us how to push the boundaries of 3D geospatial with WebGL. So please, again, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A panel at any time, and we'll answer them live at the end of the session. And that's it. Thank you very much. And I'd like to hand off to, I believe, Yvonne. Hello. Ken, do you hear me? Everything is fine, right? I hear you well. Okay, I'm going to share the, share the screen. Mm -hmm. Where is that button? Okay, here we go. Oh. This is this is a very old topic from the start of uh, WebGL. <laughs> so the problem is we still can't uh, render lines. I mean, we can render lines, of course, but uh, there are many limitations uh, and it's not as smooth as uh, in uh, Canvas 2D context. So my plan is to show you the problem, how to prepare geometry and to show the actual magic that uh, wasn't published, I believe, it wasn't published yet by anyone, maybe in some commercial projects, I don't know. Okay, so the problem, uh, we have two uh, competing solutions. The scan line is 2D solution that uh, Canvas 2D uses and uh, it's, uh, it's very good. It's performant, it's uh, uh, high quality and as a WebGL site has a multi-sample, multi it has many limitations, but 
the run to solution. But there is no solution to emulate scanline in open source. Okay, so what seems to be the problem? Uh, if you look at Pixie.js demo in 2D and in WebGL, uh, yes, the right side, uh, if, if Zoom doesn't, uh, <laughs> if, if uh, Zoom doesn't encrypt it enough, uh, the right side is very bad. Uh, without anti-aliasing, everything is bad and uh, we have to fix it some, somehow. So how to draw lines in WebGL? Uh, the first idea is to use uh, lines because WebGL actually can draw lines. It has a line strip mode for draw arrays, draw instances, and all that stuff. And uh, it has a line width. But line width is not supported in implementations. Why? Because who, who needs it? No one needed it and uh, it wasn't supported. And that's why people use it only for wire mesh. Okay, so how different renderers actually render lines that has uh, with uh, more, uh, bigger than one pixel. We can compute all the vertices of a mesh on a central processing unit and pass it as a mesh to Web, uh, to WebGL or WebGPO or something like that. It will draw it. It's a good solution, but it has a problem. How we, can we draw a line? We draw a, a rectangle that is a very wide and it, it's a, a thin, right? So if it's too thin, it's actually, um, it misses some pixels completely misses. So you, if you try, uh, try to draw a line of, uh, with one, you can, uh, or with a, a half of one, you can get the result at the left. Some pixels will be missed. And even if you use multi-sampling, there can be lines of very, very small width that will miss pixels. But who in their, uh, good health will actually draw the thin lines. Why do we need thin lines? Because this mesh can be scaled with tra transform matrix. Like uh, if you have a CAD application, an application that shows some sham uh, with many lines, you scale it, zoom it, lines can become very small and the pixels will start, will start to disappear. So, uh, and also we have a big memory footprint and it slows down everything, not only lines, any shape that you draw it uh, will be processed by multi-sampling and it might be slow. And if you no need to draw only a small number of lines, small number of pixels, yeah, everything else will slow down, it's bad. Okay, Canvas 2G is actually very good solution. It works on central processing unit. It's, it's awesome. Inside, it has a scan line. Uh, I copied uh, uh, two of uh, their slides, very good slides. So what it, it actually does, it computes a coverage of a single pixel. How the line covers this pixel? its area. It, uh, it uh, has a number of hacks, so it doesn't actually compute uh, the uh, area honestly. There can be a small error, but it's fine. And it's very performant. The only problem is it's on central process size viewing, so we can't actually um, speed up it with a uh, GPU. So if you want uh, 10,000 lines, you will have a problem. Why can we do the same as for WebGL? So scan line relies on CPU. So, and even if we didn't have a scan line, if we did like implement something on the WebAssembly, we have to upload it to WebGL memory. And it's, it's this operation is uh, costly if you want to draw many, many lines. 
Also, Skia guys will already have transferred everything if, if it was possible. And uh, some parts uh, require computer shaders, WebGPU. Uh, I'm waiting for uh, when WebGPU will be enabled everywhere so we can use compute shaders for lines too. And so what do we have to take from Skia slides? The only thing we have to take is that they are calculating coverage and it's important for us. There are many demos on WebGL with signed distance fields, uh, Bezier course, and uh, there is even a big library called Slug. It's commercial. It allows to draw big, uh, draw um, perfect uh, glyphs for fonts. It's very good for games, but uh, because it has a fragment shade, everything in a fragment shader, it can be slow on old computers that people use for browsing web. So it's uh, not exactly uh, good for uh, simple lines. We have to do something better, faster, and smaller because slug is uh, closed and everything. Okay, so we have uh, 2D shapes, uh, single distance fields. Maybe we can do something about it. Maybe. But it also relies on fragment shader. And we don't want to call holes to render a whole bounding box for this fragment shader. Okay, so the problem is defined. Let's uh, look at which uh, solutions actually exist at the moment. Many people tried to solve it. There are several articles. You can look at them at the slides. Uh, rend different renderers use uh, multi-sampling and everything. Right? And uh, so you can actually deduce from their articles how to draw, how to make your own renderer that draw lines. It's not a problem. Thank you guys, because this is a very, like, uh, not an easy task, but it's not hard, but it's time consuming. So it, you can just uh, take their code and everything will be fine. <clears throat> In general, I will describe the algorithm. I will only describe that I don't want to write code here because it's uh, like, you, you can write it yourself. Um, I'll write several steps. So the first step is to Optimize your path, remove unnecessary points, and uh, add uh, some points at the beginning and end of every path to um, give extra information for paths. So, uh, for example, if path is closed, then we have to know uh, extra point after everything, like uh, to, to close it to begin. And because we want to make a join, like meter, bevel, round, and everything, we have to add extra one extra point to know where it goes next. So uh, once you uh, made this array for uh, paths, you can just concatenate all arrays for those paths. They are separated by zeros. So it's, it's enough info to make uh, multiple lines. The next trick is described in one of articles, instanced lines. We can uh, take four consecutive points, four consecutive joins, into one instance. And each instance will have uh, nine points. Uh, it will uh, render one segment and one joint. What is good in this geometry that I will use is that it doesn't cover, cover itself. So if we use uh, alpha, like alpha dot five, then uh, we won't see intersecting parts. Uh, and because this thing uh, deal uh, like uh, every vertex in the, of those nines have access to all the info, it's very easy to make two implementations of Packer. One for uh, instance it, and one uh, in case angle instance it arrays is not supported on this computer. It sometimes happens on old uh, mobile devices. I think PC devices can support it all. Okay, so now that we have an info for a vertex shader, what do we have? We have four points and we want to draw the middle segment and uh, the one join. So for a segment, we have four points and depending on uh, the orientation of uh, adjusted points, we have to use uh, different normals for uh, bisectors. 
to calculate those vertices. It's for uh, it's for segment, and for a joint we have uh, meter, bevel, and round. Meter is uh, easy, easy. We just uh, go through the sector and calculate a point. We have four points. Uh, th that's good. And for bevel we have five points because because we have to like cut the top. Of course, maybe we can use only three points, but I use five because of uh, the stuff I will describe later. And uh, for round joints, you have to add more vertices to make it round. But uh, those two points on top, you have to spawn many vertices to make it round. But I won't do that. I, I will use different method. And there is one another join that is not described in Canvas 2D. I call it FUBAR. Because when our bisect uh, vector, bisector vector goes uh, <laughs> is longer than like is longer than uh, one of edges, then we, if it's meter, we have to go bevel, and if it's uh, in in some cases, we have to uh, we have to com compute just something. It will self intersect, but what can we do? Okay, the next step is the coverage. Is it the main step? The main step that wasn't described for 10 years of WebGL, I don't know why. Maybe some commercial solutions have it, but I failed to find it. So, suppose we have a single segment. The first problem is how to make all pixels that are at least partially covered to uh, how to call our fragment uh, shader on those pixels. So in vertex shader, instead of using with, we, uh, we have to use with plus one. That way we will cover all the pixels. It, it's all in pixel space, so plus one is fine, right? That will, will cover all the pixels. And we also have to pass the sign of distance to the line. So sign a distance on those vertices will be uh, W plus one, right? So, and the uh, negation of that. And what's the, uh, what's the awesome point of WebGL is that if you pass this to, uh, from vertex to fragment shader, then the fragment shader, you get exactly distance from center of pixel to the line. So we have to calculate this area. First, let's forget about rotation, because <laughs> if you cal calculate geometrically uh, this, uh, the error, that this, this margin, it, it's small. So make a function that intersects single halfway plane with pixel. It's obvious, it's, uh, we have to do x plus 0 0.5, but we have to clamp it because uh, our pixel has limits. So the value will be from zero to one. It's our, uh, it's the area of uh, half plane in the pixel. So how to calculate the area of uh, line? Easy, we have to subtract one half plane from another half plane. Easy enough. Okay, meter is different problem. If we look at the image, um, it's difficult. So what we have to do first, we forget about rotation. Second, we already have a function that returns from zero, uh, something from zero to one for our for some line. One of green lines, it's it's on border of our line, right? So with pixel line, we can calculate distances a1, a2, b1, b2, and the area. For area, we actually have to subtract one square from another square. That's our meter. If we forget about the inner square, then we'll get a hair, armpit hair pixel <laughs> that will affect everything. People will notice it. It's it will be a shame. Okay, bevel. The next case is if we cut uh, the meter, if the meter goes too far away, or if if a user wants to uh, just uh, we will join. Uh, we have to add one, one manual parameter is the distance between uh, vertex 
and uh, bevel line that cuts it. If you have this distance for a vertex, then we have this distance for a center of pixel, and we can compute it just by taking the minimum from a meter and the bevel, minimum of area. Of course, it's uh, not precise on the corners, but we cannot see, assume it's fine. We can assume that our corners are uh, maybe 90, uh, it's uh, like P, or if we take P, P uh, uh, div divide by two, then will be a different formula, or if you take different angles that we will have trigonometrical functions, uh, forget about it, just take minimum, it's, it's fine. So round, round is very difficult case. It combines everything and it adds a circle. What to do with a circle? It, it, for, suppose we can uh, actually calculate intersection with circle. And then we can actually just take a uh, maximum between circle and half plane that we will line forms. Uh, that way, uh, what do we will have? Of course, it's not precise at corners again but it's good enough for us. So uh, after that, we can intersect it with a meter like we did before using minimum and <laughs> it will work. Well, the only problem is how to calculate intersection with circle without using trigonometrical functions and all that stuff. So uh, we can pass the coordinates relative to circle center to the fragment shader. And there, of course, they will be interpolated and we will get the radius. And we have a distance from a point to center of circle. We can assume that the circle is actually a square, like in the old Soviet anecdote that in war time, P can equal four. Well, anecdote was about sinus, but you get it. <laughs> so we just intersect to squares, get the result, and uh, then max with B will mean with meter. So to achieve the perfect result, to uh, like uh, only, only a small, very small uh, difference between uh, scan line and our solution, we can actually intersect uh, our uh, half, half plane with a pixel that is rotated. Uh, and because of some uh, symmetry rules, the only two things we need is a uh, maximum and minimum of components of normal. If we pass it to fragment shader and use it there, we can get the formula. First, it goes like linear, then it goes uh, 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 squared because uh, it's a uh, square of triangle and no, I'm not a trapezoid. So, okay. And that's the result. It looks fine. The technique, technique is called HHAA. I won't uh, tell you what HH is, uh, some people know, so. <laughs> That's our result. Uh, where is it, uh, does it work? It works in graphics smooth uh, Pixie plugin. If you, you if you have Pixie.js application, you can just drop in the Pixie smooth, swap it or default Pixie class to this and it will work. So all the applications can just uh, add one more plugin and it, it will work for all Pixie applications. Uh, and uh, the thing is it was used from the first week because some people really needed that plugin. And so far, so far it uh, gave us good results. By Zoom, you won't see the the best result here because uh, the video compression, but if you open slides, it's, it's uh, very good. So extra style parameters. Uh, we have some parameters that don't exist in Canvas 2D. First is line scale mode. It's, it's from Adobe Flash. So we can scale line depending on your transformation. If you don't want to line to scale in pixels, then you just uh, set it to none and it works. Okay, so, uh, hey, sorry, <laughs> uh, line alignment, that, it, it comes from uh, XJS. Matt Groves implemented it somehow, and uh, it's uh, good because you can 
uh, do inners or outers of your shape. And it's totally different from just uh, changing vertices, uh, changing points in Canvas 2D because it, you, you will have different uh, corners of joints. And another thing is bevel limit. It exists to like smooth the meter limit. In, uh, and uh, sometimes it's, it's much better for plots. It's work in progress. Okay, where am I? Slide. Okay, no, no, batching, batching, batching. So uh, there are a number of attributes, number of styles, uh, extra styles, and uh, what actually, uh, uh, what about their performance? Depending on which, uh, attribute, uh, which uh, numbers, which values you, where you place them, uh, you can use uh, either attributes, either styles, either, uh, uh, either uniform buffers, either data textures. Uh, for uniform buff buffers and data textures, you have to put the ID of the style to the attribute. It's, it's like, it's general approach on uh, for batching. So animated, everything animated goes in uh, styles. So you can just modify a style, modify a uniform without, modify, without pre the buffer. Uh, so what can I say about benchmark? I didn't benchmark it yet. I just didn't have time because I have many, many projects. For example, just my Minecraft clone that needs base instancing that can mention. So I didn't do benchmarks, but it works in production. If someone helps me with benchmarks, I will be. That's all. Thank you for watching. Uh, I'm very excited to finally uh, describe it all to people. So HHA has an, at least one article with my, uh, my slides. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for that. And so uh, moving on uh, to our uh, next uh, presenter. And again, um, this session is being recorded. So you will be able to go back and, and watch this. Also, um, uh, housekeeping for those that are joining us now, don't forget to um, add your questions over in the Q&A and then upvote any questions that you see that also uh, you'd like to have answered. And so uh, Thomas, your screen is up. And when you're ready, the floor is yours. All right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about WebGPU. What I'm going to share is basically our journey um, about on, uh, on porting the Babylon JS engine for, uh, for WebGPU. So uh, I'm, I'm Thomas, uh, also uh, present is Sebastian, who uh, will be answering uh, real questions you want to have at the end that I definitely couldn't um, answer myself. And also want to say, uh, you know, a big up and congratulations to Alexi, who's been uh, for actually a very long time working very hard on this, um, this porting of the, of the engine. So moving on, on to the origins, which are actually quite um, uh, far-fetched. Uh, we started the uh, first experimentation back in 2019 with uh, a first version uh, of the engine. And um, there was this uh, initial bundle demo of Forest where we could really see um, the difference in terms of performance. We could render a lot of trees basically much, much faster than in, a, than in WebGL was his first version of the, of the engine. Um, at its uh, origin, at its creation, um, the Babylon JS engine was designed to be agnostic. It um, offers a, um, a layer on top of um, WebGL 1, WebGL 2, that is completely um, um, agnostic. So uh, the team looking into the WebGPU implementation really had in mind to maintain uh, a backward compatibility uh, with having the goal to uh, be able to uh, offer to the user the possibility of no code change basically when they would migrate from um, the WebGL version of their application to, um, to WebGL. And we're gonna see how this materialize um, at the end and throughout the journey. That was really one of the core things. Um, so that was the, the first steps in 2019, 2020 uh, was really when the, the, the core, uh, the biggest part of the work was, was done, porting all the engine features one by one. Um, 
so it was actually a lot of work from uh, uh, for Alexi here. And uh, at the end of the year, we reached a, a good milestone uh, and we migrated, uh, we merged the, this work that was in separate branch to the main branch of the uh, Babylon, uh, Babylon JS, so the alpha version in some ways of, um, of um, Babylon 5. At this point, uh, anybody could go to the Babylon playground and test, right? Uh, write some code and, and do the first experimentations uh, of their code. Um, the learning there, since we were very early, was that the collaboration was essential, right? This tight relationship we had with the designing, uh, the teams designing and implementing WebGPU in the browser was key. Uh, we uh, provided feedback and we also got a lot of feedback. Um, so today, um, it's here, um, basically, uh, as a beta version. Um, you can go to um, the playground. Um, you'll see that on the right, um, there is a uh, drop-down um, list like this, and you can just select WebGPU, assuming that you are on a browser that um, supports it. So it can be uh, under the WebGPU flag uh, in Chrome and Edge Canary. It can also be, as Ken was mentioning, on the, um, via the origin trial of Chrome and Edge. It's not um, every uh, browser, every uh, instance, right, that, that is um, available right now. It's, it's being the origin trial is being rolled out. So if you want to be 100% and check right away, you have to go to the, the, the Canary version. And with time, uh, everybody will be able to, to get through the origin trial. And we also have to, to check on, on uh, Firefox. Um, the learning, and that was that's a very important one here, is um, is regarding the um, the shader language, right? Um, for those who don't know, uh, WebGPU introduces a new um, shader language, Wigzel. Um, so if you start from scratch a new shader, then uh, we have a shader material, and, and that's simple. You can just write over there. But if you have existing shader in uh, GLSL, that's when uh, there is a need for some kind of conversion uh, mechanism. And um, the problem we have today is that um, those libraries that do the conversion are still big, about two meg. So it's, uh, it's a little bit heavy. Um, that's one of the things, um, you know, probably have to work on uh, as a community in the, in the future for being able to migrate, right? For those who have uh, existing um, content. Talking about existing applications, let's look at what it takes. I was uh, talking about uh, background, uh, backward compatibility um, at the beginning. Well, today, um, if you have your application, what you have to do is really, uh, at the minimum, is update the engine creation, uh, going from uh, synchronous to any synchronous, uh, basically, uh, initialization. And that's, um, that's it. So uh, there is uh, there are a few uh, breaking changes. Um, so you can check the documentation; they are uh, well documented there, and uh, still early. So uh, there is, of course, some feedback uh, you may have, and you can reach reach us, um, reach out to us on the forum. We're there every day, making sure that every question gets answers by the community or by the core team. Um, that's for the existing stuff. Let's talk about the new stuff, right? So. Uh, um, some of the folks before already mentioned the compute shader. That's very exciting. That's web GPU only feature that we ported in uh, 2021. And it opens up a new world, right? Non-graphic parallel processing. That was before possible on, uh, on WebGL, but you had to trick your way in. Now it's uh, completely um, natural and, um, you know, by design working with, uh, with web GPU. So you can do things like uh, <coughs> simulation. You have the right here, Notion simulations. Uh, can can do some computer uh, vision and uh, actually I'm gonna switch screen here and let's go to the demo mode. Uh, so in this page uh, you have a, a few demos that we did. So some the some were just porting some existing demos. Uh, the image blur um, that is here. Uh, it's an existing web GPU demo that we ported to uh, to Babylon. So. Um, that's a simple use case, like for each pixel, the, the blur is uh, calculated. And that's an interesting usage, right, for, for videos, uh, maybe, or for image of, of WebGPU. So a little bit different than what we have, uh, usually in, um, in Babylon with the 3D. Another interesting one um, that was done by um, uh, Sebast Lag, uh, and we ported this to WebGPU and uh, computer is a 
hydraulic uh, simulation. So uh, what we have here is a representation of a terrain that is um, generated with a compute shader and the erosion uh, is simulated. So as I move here through times, um, the water, the effect of the water on uh, the terrain is being simulated. And, you know, as we move, I don't know, maybe millions of years, right? We have the formation of lakes uh, 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 the, um, with time. And another uh, very cool web GPU compute shader is a slime simulation also done by uh, um, uh, this uh, Sebastian. And it's, uh, it's here. So slime, think of uh, a um, microorganism unicellular that um, when they work together, they can um, group together uh, and they form some amazing patterns, right? So the simulation is um, also uh, using a compute shaders here and you can simulate the several uh, species if you are a fan of uh, slime molds. So going back to uh, the presentation here. There is this ocean demo that is, this one is, is kind of heavy. You use between 200 and 250 uh, compute shaders to, to render uh, this. You, you can check out on your machine if you have a good, um, good, a good credit card, I would say, good uh, <laughs> uh, graphic card. Um, the learning here is it was fun. I think uh, well, that's what I heard from the team is like, oh, writing, starting from a blank page and writing a new feature. It was really, uh, really exciting. And all these new demos that um, um, they ported, Alexi ported were, uh, were fun. Talking about something else uh, is talking about performance, which is, which is key. And, and that's uh, talking about render bundle, uh, which is a key feature of web, uh, web GPU. We talk a little bit about it at the beginning with the forest. So what we did here is we um, 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 set in place a um, fast pass that for specific situation would work uh, faster or even much faster. Um, so the first uh, version of this is what we call the snapshot recording. The way it works is that it records draw calls during one frame and then it replays them. Uh, it replays for um, all the subsequent uh, frames. So that can uh, bring performance uh, up to time tens uh, better. Uh, and I have some little numbers here. So if you see a WebGL version, uh, we have about 200 uh, FPS. Uh, Web GPU compatibility mode, so just changing one line of code, uh, is uh, a little um, slower on the uh, JavaScript uh, thread actually. And then it's a bit better on the GPU, um, GPU thread. It's basically we're moving the state management to, um, to JavaScript. So uh, it's a little slower. Uh, the gain here is in, is in terms of uh, power management and that it's uh, slightly better. And then if we activate the snapshot recording, then we get um, better performance than, um, than WebGL uh, up to much better performance C times 10 here. Uh, I can actually think of time. Yeah, I have to, uh, to show this because I wanted to show this in live here. Oh, computer. Here, the poor plant. Oh. Here, full screen. Sorry. Um, so there, is, there are several versions of this uh, power plant. I'm gonna refresh here. Oop. Okay, let me just restart. Sometimes the session needs to be restarted. Here. So we're gonna start with the WebGL version. And that's uh, you know seen with cascaded shadow. That's what we I think we used it for when we developed the cascaded shadow feature. Uh, so WebGL, we see we see oh, so this is not really applicable here. So in WebGL, we have about when it's stabilized about 120 virtual uh, frame per second. If I move to WebGPU and I um, have the 100% 
compatibility mode that I'm a, a little um, slower, as you can see here. When I activate the screen, the uh, snapshot snapshot recording, I'm uh, getting better. I'm getting faster than uh, WebGL, up to much faster uh, here, 10 times faster. And I mean, this scene is it just working is the same for this scene. Uh, it's exactly the, exactly the same. So moving back to the presentation here, I wanted to say that, um, so those performance are, don't work for everything, right? It works for the scenes that are mostly static. Um, so when there is no pipeline change and that works very well for e-commerce, right? Things about showing a product, um, zooming uh, uh, in, a, in a product, even animations um, work. Uh, if you want to add mesh or add something like transparency, uh, then you can uh, reset and uh, update um, the, the snapshot and, and then get the performance after again. And that's the key thing there is, is been this of this journey was to manage, to maintain some kind of backward compatibility while ensuring performance. And their approach here is basically providing several um, solutions and then depending on your application, on where you are also uh, in, your, in your own journey for, for your application, you can move the cursor, right? More towards backward compatibility at the beginning to see what works and then in specific case, uh, gain more performance. The journey is not over on our hand. We're still working uh, for more fast pass optimization. I was talking here about the uh, snapshot recording. We want to add a more granular um, uh, mode where you can do more things basically and uh, still benefit from uh, render bundles. So this has yet, um, yet to come and we're working on this. Alex is working on this. There are also some promising things with the external texture I was showing the blur um, images um, uh, at the beginning on video. Well, we think about filters on videos, this kind of things that can uh, benefit from GPU and to finish. Uh, and that's definitely long-term is uh, once the web GPU is uh, more ubiquitous is uh, maybe for us to work in our node material editor where you can create shader and that would generate uh, Wixel. That's it, thank you all. If you want more information, you can reach out on the forum and there is a full documentation available. Thank you all. Great presentation. Thank you so much. So don't forget, folks, uh, drop your questions and answers over in the Q&A. We'll make sure to get to that after our next presenter. Tom, we see your screen. So whenever you're up, go ahead. Thanks. Um, so today I'll talk a little bit about how uh, Esri, we're trying to push uh, 3D GIS boundaries uh, with WebGL. Uh, WebGL or the web is one of the premier platform for the geospatial community. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, use cases and uh, what is really happening in the geospatial world in our, in our, in our example. Um, so let me go ahead and uh, get it started right here. Um, so 3D GIS or GIS is really advancing and uh, 3D GIS in particular is advancing in, in various fields, uh, whether it's uh, for landscapes, uh, building, uh, building information model or networks or uh, cityscapes, you know, for planning purposes. Um, there is a really a move towards having um, all the geospatial infrastructure and data uh, in, in what typically people call this digital twin, uh, a representation of the real world. Uh, it could be a realistic representation, it could be thematic representation, but having that kind of representation is, uh, is uh, gaining a huge momentum. And 3D WebGIS is uh, driving this digital transformation, if you will, uh, by you know, helping organizations kind of envision a different workflow. And um, with, with different parts of organizations sharing uh, different types of uh, common information model, um, this change has really come up uh, front and center. And um, uh, what we're seeing now is that um, 3D capabilities um, are integrated across the ArcGIS system. So uh, when we uh, debut a new feature, uh, this feature has to work in desktop and mobile and increasingly also on the web. And as you can see on this slide, um, the web is taking a bigger share of uh, 3D GIS experiences. 
these experiences are developer experiences, are non-developer experiences, uh, but more and more uh, it has become essential, imperative to have an immersive, engaging, performant uh, 3D web experience and WebGL is really uh, the reason that we have that uh, capability. Um, now, how do we do that? You know, as I said, like we share uh, content, uh, both desktop, mobile, and web. And uh, mind you, some of this content are in hundreds and hundreds of gigabytes, terabytes, and uh, there is really, really uh, 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 a business uh, use case as well as uh, just uh, uh, technical, you know, requirement to have uh, a common data format that you can share across this uh, different uh, devices and uh, different um, uh, different uh, platforms. Uh, so the way we do that is uh, we uh, similarly, like uh, as in uh, uh, WebGL, we 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 really leverage standards standards for streaming uh, 3D content. And one of the standards that we really highly rely on is uh, the Index 3D Scene Layer or I3S uh, format, which is an OGC uh, Open Community Standard. And uh, I3S has a common team uh, that allows us to have different use cases um, that supports uh, the storage and transmission of very large data consisting of uh, millions of 3D discrete objects with attributes, as well as integrated surfaces, uh, surface mesh that cover uh, thousands and thousands of uh, square miles. Uh, it was designed from the ground up to be cloud and uh, web and mobile friendly, uh, based on JSON and REST and modern interfaces. And um, it's designed also to support 3D geospatial content with, uh, with the requisite uh, corner systems and hype models that are very uh, you know, prevalent and essential in uh, the geospatial world. So there are five layer types to support in this uh, streaming uh, format, uh, 3D objects, uh, your 3D shapes, trees, building infrastructure, uh, as well as uh, points in layer where you can symbolize a point uh, that point could be symbolized with uh, a 3D model, uh, such as GLTF models or others, uh, and could be again shared across the web and also on desktop and mobile uh, uh, platforms. Um, an integrated mesh layer is the uh, probably one of the more popular type of layer of uh, an I3S, which we call skin of the earth type of layer that marries both texture and geometry, uh, and is typically captured by a drone or uh, or from uh, is generated from photogrammetric processes, um, as well as uh, point clouds in there, LiDAR data. Uh, now there is uh, uh, from your handheld phone up to uh, very sophisticated systems that capture LiDAR data, all, uh, uh, both uh, terrestrial and uh, aerial, uh, as well as uh, uh, as well as uh, building information layer captured in a layer type that we call building scene layer that allows you to uh, see detailed building models and. Uh, can be imported uh, from formats such as Reddit. So that's the glue that actually allows us to, uh, you know, be able to um, uh, stream this content to both desktop, mobile, and uh, you know, web platforms. And uh, the 3D, as I said in the beginning, 3D web GIS has taken full front and center uh, because you know the visual experience uh, people want and to and want and desire to see in the web uh, is not limited anymore. Uh, before, you know, there could be compromises that people used to, to say, "Well, it's okay, it's on the web; it should, doesn't need to be." But now, really, they wanted to actually perform and look better, uh, primarily in the web, uh, and then, of course, supplement that also on the desktop and mobile platforms. Um, so here's a, a quick example of. Uh, uh, both the 3D features or database-driven view of a city, say, for example, this is the city of uh, Boston, uh, where you have on the uh, left um, uh, 3D features that are database-driven uh, and are uh, rendered according to some uh, thematic information stored with the attribute of the data, uh, whereas on the right is the 3D mesh, the integrated mesh layer that I uh, described earlier that captures the reality as is. Uh, but then it is also a marriage of the two, right? That folks would like to see both uh, coexisting uh, at the same time, uh, at the same space sometimes, and be able to merge and mesh that information. Um, but just you know, visualizing it is not enough uh, because uh, oftentimes our users would like to see 
uh, uh, would like to see, um, I guess, uh, let me go back to this slide, uh, would like to see the uh, ability to actually uh, do some quick analysis. Uh, for example, like here, you will see that uh, people are uh, being able to, or users want to be able to do uh, a profile, you know, quick profile of uh, the terrain. Uh, again, dynamically being able to uh, click anywhere and get that profile would be uh, a feature that uh, folks would like to do within a WebJS environment. Um, another one, another uh, quick example here is a uh, uh, line of sight or in shadow analysis. Here, what you see is that, you know, people want to build like scenarios, uh, scenario A versus scenario B, where you can compare uh, again uh, in a performance web environment, uh, being able to model different scenarios of a cityscape or a planning, uh, planning scenario is very key for uh, most of our user base. Uh, my favorite here is also being able to model, uh, you know, shadow analysis, you know, how long will an area be under shadow? And this could be very important, say, in temperate areas where how long you've been in the, uh, how long during the day you are in the shadow could actually mean how much you have to pay for your apartment, right? And there's a relationship between getting the amount of sun uh, versus shadow. So. Those kind of analysis could be done dynamically, could be done on the web, and could be done uh, efficiently uh, without any compromise. And this is where we are at now, and uh, where we're really pleased to be able to do uh, uh, to do this kind of uh, uh, features uh, uh, within the web, web environment itself. Uh, another area is being able to model, as I showed it in the first slide, uh, the first few slides, from the same content. So what you're seeing here is city of San Francisco. Uh, the first uh, uh, was a realistic or reality capture view, uh, whereas the second one was the schematic. And now we switched to the hand-drawn, very cartographic friendly kind of view. This is all driven from the same data, the same information model, the same layer, the same scene layer, 3D objects layer, uh, kind of part of this view that you see uh, from pink texture to schematically represented and to um, kind of attractive hand-drawn uh, models. Um, users are also using, you know, the 3D system that we have uh, for modeling climate change and disaster response. And uh, here, this is uh, even more important having realism, you know, being able to see uh, the water uh, with reflectance and then also being able to model, say, flood lines, 100 year flood lines and whatnot is very engaging. And this is uh, very important for planners, for decision makers to be able to see this and communicate and being able to pull it up and do it on their, you know, laptop and, uh, and mobile devices is, is very uh, key and engaging. Um, so the, you know, meshing of all this content and data into an attractive uh, and appealing uh, uh, user experience uh, is uh, driving this, uh, you know, geospatial uh, industry really at this point. Uh, another example of the uh, three objects in there, uh, the uh, uh, I3S in there is a building in there. This is very uh, engaging way of, uh, this is a, a live, uh, this is a, uh, this is, this model is uh, uh, for, a, uh, for a museum. And as you can see, it can reveal through the layer, uh, you know, very interactively and also be able to isolate certain features. For example, in this case, the, uh, the stairs have been isolated or they are excluded from being peeled apart. Uh, but then you can do also mensuration, you can do measuring, yeah, you can do, uh, you can see the relationship between the other uh, content that you have within the view. And again, uh, being able to do this uh, from city wide scale uh, to building or infrastructure level within the same view, within the same scene, uh, is very uh, empowering for a lot of users. So just to uh, uh, kind of bring it up, um, GLTF is uh, one of the format that we are actually also uh, heavily dependent on uh, in the 3D WebGIS. And uh, one thing that we use that in, in having standards, so what it helps is really being able to obtain consistency uh, not only on the web, but all the platforms. Because again, as I said, uh, we, since we have a need and our user base has a need to be able to, you know, visualize the same content in all these different platforms, having a 3D format uh, and a, a 3D 
uh, uh, standard that allows you to actually share this uh, among different platforms is very essential. Uh, and this helps actually also eliminate you know, consistencies that you see when a model is created somewhere else and brought into the application uh, and into the different types of application. Uh, some of the inconsistencies, aesthetic inconsistencies you see could be, could be avoided by, you know, uh, by using a standard such as IGLTF. Um, this covers a whole bunch of, you know, industries and sectors in the geospatial world, uh, uh, but uh, there is a lot of overlap, even from uh, game developers to, uh, you know, architectural designers uh, to the uh, geo-analysts. There's a lot of overlap in industry sectors that this, this uh, really impacts. Uh, and we strive to actually make uh, uh, sure that our support for it in both the web and desktop uh, are uh, consistent. Um, just to last slide on this one, this uh, feature or this format will be supported across uh, everywhere where, uh, where all of our application run the RTS API for JavaScript and can load and uh, place a GLTF model and supports uh, PBR, uh, PBR uh, properties and uh, is, uh, can be, can be um, uh, efficiently and uh, uh, correctly visualized. Um, here's an example actually how uh, that, uh, that is uh, utilized. Uh, this is a citizen engagement uh, collaborative uh, planning um, uh, application. And what you're seeing here is that uh, uh, the planning process uh, could be done. Oh, the video is not, not some, okay, now it's going good. Um, so the planning process could be done in 3D. So you're doing a sketching, you're doing actually, uh, you know, proposing where if a building goes up here, what it would look like if we have a park. Uh, uh, and if we import some models, you know, those trees that you saw were imported as GLTF. Um, and uh, can be planted within the 3D application itself. And, and, and models could be brought from uh, uh, GLTF warehouses and be planted into the application uh, or into the view to quickly and easily give a user uh, sort of a, a planning engagement application that allows you to uh, visualize uh, the scenario or what if scenario. Um, so, Summary here, and then I'll go to my uh, 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 slide to a really quick uh, demo. Um, so the current trend is pointing for 3D WebGIS to become the primary interface for most geospatial users. This is really amazing news, right? A uh, few years back, we, we were using this as sort of com you know compatibility mode where it would be a feature would be supported, but now it's become the primary feature. Where, or the primary uh, platform where people actually would want to see uh, 3D GIS uh, grow. Um, out of the box functionality without coding, as well as a robust API for JavaScript and configurable authoring experience is essential to advance this. And having the consistency of experience and data and quality uh, between web, desktop and mo mobile experience is gonna be key going forward. Um, there's some fragmentation of features between various browsers is still a risk for a wider adoption uh, to make it the standard for us, uh, but it's, it's going in the right direction. Um, and we're working to, uh, the XJS API for JavaScript uh, works uh, <clears throat> to support all kind of the 3D data that are supported in the desktop and the uh, mobile uh, uh, platforms um, so that users would have uh, consistent uh, feel and look. Uh, more patterns are emerging uh, using WebAssembly as a glue uh, between various platforms and enabling us to bring more features quickly to the web platform. So again, since we have to do the same thing in two, three, four, two, three, at least three uh, platforms, uh, using WebAssembly is very efficient and, um, and attractive for us, especially for uh, something that will develop for the desktop, uh, written C++ and then can be ported to the web is very, uh, very attractive, uh, not only from performance point of view, but also from efficiency. Um, our web uh, solution, our 3D web solution has already switched to WebGL 2.0 in all our uh, 3D application. By default, uh, it is now using WebGL 2.0. Um, we're taking advantage of uh, 3D textures, uh, gel, uh, uh, gel frag depth, as well as uh, uniform buffer and others 
in the WebGL 2.0 standard. So uh, real quick, uh, I think maybe if I have one minute, uh, I would uh, like to show some of that. Um, this is the I3S uh, standard that I talked about and we'll have it in the uh, application in the uh, slides. And then uh, some of the videos that I've shown, I've, I've shown actually, you can see a live, a live application of all those in here that you can, uh, you will be able to uh, just interact in, uh, and uh, play with that. Uh, the code is right there and you should be able uh, to also just uh, uh, activate it. Um, as I mentioned, WebGL 2.0 is supported. We have switched, uh, this just happened in September. We have uh, switched all of our uh, web, um, yeah, 3D web experience to uh, support WebGL 2.0 wherever it's available. Um, some of the experiences that I mentioned are also available here. Uh, again, uh, most of the uh, experiences where should you be able to, so for example, uh, select an area and uh, uh, clip that area, um, you'll be able to do that uh, uh, within the application itself. Um, one thing that uh, we've done uh, within this uh, last uh, six months was support for KTX2. Uh, this has actually brought a lot of advantage, uh, a lot of improvement in, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in actually the amount of memory that the application uses. So if you look on the right here, the memory usage of this application uh, that is using KTX2, this is an I3S layer with KTX2, it's about 230 megabytes versus uh, 660 uh, in the one that is using JPEG. So this again would increase our capability uh, across the application. Um, so I think I, I'm about running out of time. So at this point, maybe I should uh, turn it around to uh, the presenters. Yeah, great demo. Thank you. So it looks like um, we do have uh, just a, a few minutes left. Uh, for some uh, questions. So uh, don't forget, folks, uh, please put your uh, Q&A uh, into that uh, part down there in the bottom, and we'll go ahead and answer those questions for you. Uh, while we wait for you to ask, we'll go ahead and jump in. Uh, first question we have, hi, I want to understand what was the rationale to present another GPU API, web GPU? Why not uh, to continue bringing missing features into WebGL and newer versions of the standard. So uh, maybe Ken, that's a good one for you. Yes, happy to uh, discuss this. So uh, investigation was done uh, early on, you know, some four years ago into uh, bringing, say, compute shaders into WebGL. And uh, Intel in particular did a tremendous amount of work and actually got this working substantially. Uh, they added a WebGL to compute uh, version of the specification. Now. After a lot of discussion among all the browser implementers uh, and experimentation, as a matter of fact, we found that continuing to pursue in the direction of mobile OpenGLES was kind of um, a dead end, okay? Uh, OpenGLES 3.2, with all of the rendering features that it has incorporated, was gonna be very, very difficult, uh, and in some cases impossible to port all of the uh, rendering features to all platforms. Uh, and secondarily, at the time, all of the new low-level explicit rendering APIs, like Direct3D 12 and Metal and Vulkan, had become, uh, had just come out. And the thing is that the structure of these APIs is radically different than OpenGL's, okay? They don't have the kind of global state that OpenGL does where basically that state can change between any two draw calls that you might make, which means that whenever you issue a draw call in OpenGL or WebGL, you basically have to validate that that draw call is okay to execute. And the other APIs are predicated around pre-verification of all of this state. So once you've created your render pipeline, you know that you'll be able to render with it. And or it's pre-validation really is the term that I was looking for. Um, and this radical uh, API restructuring basically means that the performance ceiling is raised very, very much higher than you'll ever be able to achieve with the OpenGL family style of APIs. So the decision was made to form a, a W3C community group uh, where a, a clean slate API could be developed that abstracts, that abstracts over 
the new family of 3D APIs. And that's that's why we've gotten there. And the fact that um, that WebGPU is is out there and you know coming to the fore is going to mean that it'll be a lot easier to integrate brand new GPU features like ray tracing, like mesh shaders, you know, very exciting uh, and powerful functionality into the API much more smoothly than it would have been if we were going uh, continued in the direction of WebGL. So uh, at this point, I mean, WebGL will be supported forever. Okay? You don't have to worry about it disappearing from browsers. And WebGL2 is a great baseline that you can rely on across all browsers, all operating systems at this point. So if you need to ship today, use WebGL. Um, but we absolutely encourage you to start working with WebGPU, um, start using Babylon and uh, using and contributing to 3JS's WebGPU backend. And, um, and you'll be able to, uh, to really get amazing experiences in the web browser, amazing 3D experiences. Great. So um, then to follow up on that, Ken, uh, we have two other questions kind of related to that. So it says, uh, do you see WebGL being deprecated in the future since it seems like the API is moving towards WebGPU? Um, Sounds like you answer that, but do you want to touch on to that? Sure, I'm happy to. No, we don't see WebGL being deprecated. I mean, there are millions of websites using it today. And until we have some kind of compatibility story uh, for it, where we could, you know, plausibly like pull some more of the WebGL implementation out of the core browser. And th there are ideas around this. Um, for example, the rocket science uh, idea is we take the Engel project, which is an OpenGL ES implementation that supports WebGL. And we write a, a backend for it either in uh, Chromium's Dawn project or in, uh, in Mozilla's uh, WGPU RS project. Okay, both of these are, are native level Web GPU implementations. So we could host WebGL on top of WebGPU and then compile that library using WebAssembly and publish it as a module in the browser. And that's the way that we could support WebGL. That would be very cool and exciting. Um, but it, we don't have a product roadmap for that yet because we're trying to, to finish other various aspects. So um, the short answer is no, we're not going to deprecate WebGL. We're going to support it. Uh, we're going to make uh, very, very targeted enhancements to it, like multi-draw, which just uh, came out recently in the past few months and has delivered tremendous performance improvements for applications and actually has informed uh, the WebGPU feature set. So anyway, we're gonna continue to evolve it um, judiciously, but we're focusing most resources on WebGPU. Great, and did you um, already start to migrate uh, code base to WebGPU or do you plan it? And if so, what do you consider as major difficulty in the migration? Um, the vast majority of Chrome's uh, web facing API graphics team is working on WebGPU. Now, when you say migrate code base, I mean, Chrome is a complete uh, WebGPU implementation or almost complete WebGPU implementation. Uh, and so does Firefox. Uh, Safari was well along the way uh, before some API changes happens, and I'm sure that they're going to catch back up. So I'm not really sure exactly what the, the question is, but no, we haven't started any work on an Eng uh, a, web, uh, a Dawn backend for Angle. That's, that's more of a rocket science project. Did we want to go on to some other questions? Okay. Yes, we do. So okay. um, the next questions, uh, we have uh, time for just a, a few more. Um, so uh, are there any thoughts about web GPU usage through mscripting in this round? Or would uh, I need to get in touch with the mscripting people for this? There is absolutely uh, a great synergy there. So basically today you can use either Mozilla's or Chromium's implementation, native implementation of WebGPU via a header called webgpu.h. And you can write uh, C, C++, Rust applications using that API. You can compile them outside the browser, develop them, debug them. And then basically you can use mscripten, recompile them, and yes, they run in the browser. It's, it's magic. I mean, just like OpenGLES and mscripten support for that, uh, you can do the same now for WebGPU. And it's a tremendously exciting way of getting 
you know, very, very close to the absolute bleeding edge uh, native graphics API feature set in the browser with tremendous performance. Um, and if I could, can I jump in and, and answer the first question on status of Spear V support for Wixel? Of course. Okay. So that one, uh, there's great news here. Um, so both um, the Tint project, which is the shader translator for uh, Chromium's implementation of WebGPU, and Naga, which is Mozilla's uh, shader translator for WebGPU, are well on the path to being able to handle this completely. And so basically today, as I understand it, Tint has a fully functional Spear V reader. So you can read Spear V and spit out the, the standard WGSL. So you can compile that portion of Tint with mscripten and use, and use it as a WebAssembly module um, that can take in basically any Spear V that you may have you know, produced or be able to produce and it'll, it'll run in the browser. Um, now, in terms of like the binding models and stuff, I'm not 100% sure, and you should absolutely feel free to reach out to the WebGP community group via the channels that I mentioned in my presentation. Um, but we absolutely want to make this a seamless path and, uh, and get you know, the entire SpearV ecosystem running great in the browser via this, these translation paths. Awesome. And then um, what are your thoughts on WebGPU as a native API? Technically, you could build an application on top of Dawn or Web uh, WGPU and has a nice side effect of being able to target web easily. Do you see WebGPU as an API being applicable outside of the web? Absolutely. Um, WebGPU is a great porting layer, uh, has been well designed to, to have like the minimal number of, um, of porting facilities integrated into it while still retaining the broad feature set and high performance of the native APIs. So I think that if you're developing, you know, native applications and you, you need to target, you know, Windows and Linux and Android and Mac all with one code base, I think using the WebGP native implementations is a great way. And you get the awesome side effect of being able to just take that app, recompile it for the web and run it. So um, I absolutely advocate for you to all investigate that path. And then now we have time for just a couple more questions. Um, how does uh, one go from WebGL 3JS uh, app to WebGPU? Will it port easily? Well, I, you just saw the Babylon JS team's uh, uh, example of how to use the WebGPU backend, and it was like a two-line change in the, in the app. So it's going to be uh, super easy and in some cases completely automatic. You may not even need to know uh, what's going on behind the scenes. So yes. Uh, you'll you'll get full compatibility and access to the latest feature set and performance very easily. Okay, and um, it looks like uh, actually we have about seven more minutes, so uh, I guess we can answer the rest of, of these questions. Uh, does anyone know what happened to WebGLStats.com? Uh, I do not. It's um the the maintainer found it basically impossible to keep up with the uh, the scaling requirements of it and. Uh, and the, the maintenance requirements. And so unfortunately it was taken offline. Yes, we agree that it was a very useful resource and we've had discussions with the, uh, the maintainer of WebGL stats, the former maintainer. We'd like to bring something similar to it online, probably gathering similar data from browser telemetry. Uh, and you know, we're, we're negotiating with our own you know, privacy and security teams about what data can be gathered and published. And of course it has to be aggregated and anonymized but um, you, you may remember that Unity used to publish statistics on uh, platform usage. And unfortunately, that seems to not be published anymore either. So we'd, we'd very much like to get some information out there to the community so you know these are the common you know, GPUs and these are the common uh, features and, and parameters that you can rely on in your application. So anyway, we, we will try to do better on this in coming months. Fantastic. And so uh, Lars asks, uh, what about multi-GPU systems? Is choosing a GPU part of the API? Uh, it is. You can select a particular GPU device according to characteristics that your application specifies. Uh, and so, for example, on dual GPU systems or systems with eGPUs, uh, you can prefer the high-performance GPU. And, uh, and that's it, it's a much nicer way of, uh, of handling it than 
simply the, the two knobs of you know low power versus high performance that WebGL offered. So we're looking forward to applications having uh, finer grains control over what they want to do in WebGPU. And then uh, Fahad asks, um, do you see uh, with WebGPU the web will be on par with native? I think so. I think that this is a tremendously exciting inflection point where uh, there's going to be just a, a quantum step, quantum leap step forward in the browser ecosystem where it really uh, gets on par with the, the native ecosystem. And so again, I encourage everybody to start, you know, messing around with compute shader plus uh, graphics examples in WebGPU today. Um, what you can do, you know, just in the samples that uh, some of our, our colleagues and team members have made is just amazing and it's only gonna get more amazing. So yeah, get excited and please start publishing stuff. Great, and then um, uh, then to, to kind of bunch these two together, any info about web GPU dev tools or browsers gonna implement some uh, something this time and are there any deep bug tools planned targeting web GPU related code? There is absolutely a great deal of thought that has been going on in all the browsers about how we're going to uh, debug web GPU code uh, surface any errors that happen in web GPU applications and, uh, and also integrate well with native development tools. Um, it's probably not, you know, uh, appropriate for me to hypothesize here or, or speak for anybody else, but, um, we've heard from, uh, Apple's Safari team that they've got some pretty amazing low level graphical developer tools where you can like profile shaders and you can see instruction counts on various lines of shaders, which is pretty amazing. Um, on the Chromium side, we would like to integrate better with native uh, development tools per platform development tools like RenderDoc um, and make it really seamless to get you know, a trace of your application over there for analysis. So you can expect us to work hard to streamline these, um, these paths in coming months. And uh, I think that's probably all I can say right now. Great. And uh, WebGPU support uh, Inspector JS. <laughs> Thomas. So it's actually something we are discussing currently with uh, with the community, uh, just to see how we could do it. Uh, it's quite harder than it is for uh, for OpenGL, unfortunately. It's like OpenGL has a lot of introspection API we can rely on, so it was not that complex to build. Uh, doing it for WebGPU might be a bit uh, harder, but we are trying to think about it. I wish we had something directly built in, in the browser, but currently we are using Pix. Uh, on when we develop on Windows, we are using Pix to troubleshoot, and it's uh, now it's it's the experience is pretty good. It was not possible before just with WebGL. Great, and then um, last question we have here from Lars: um, What about memory limits? Well, we still have the around two gigabyte memory limits on the GPU. Okay, so. I assume that you're talking about um, limits that, that Chrome probably implemented in its uh, handling of like buffered data. Um, and, and maybe, I, I don't remember, I don't have the IDL in front of me, but it's possible that uh, WebG, WebGL's Web IDL says uh, that the, the size argument to that isn't all the way up to 64 bits. Um, and I actually don't know off the top of my head again, when you allocate a WebGP buffer, what the maximum size is. I th uh, two points are that I, in, in, in one browser, Chrome, we received feedback from multiple customers that they needed more headroom on how much total memory they could allocate for their uh, WebGL applications. And we raised those limits in response to this feedback. So today you can access, you know, many, many gigabytes, 16, maybe even 32 gigabytes of memory, um, assuming that your machine has the physical memory to handle that. In WebGPU, this is something that uh, should be discussed if it's not already supported. So please, you know, reach out, look at the WebGPU IDL, see what the, um, the argument types are for allocating buffers. And if you're finding that there's like a structural limit there, then why don't you go ahead and raise that with the community group through some of the channels that have been mentioned today. Thanks. 
Great. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Ken, uh, Yvonne, Thomas, and Tom for a great presentation of another one of our uh, WebGL and uh, WebGPU meetups for fall. Again, folks, um, this uh, recording uh, will be made available at the link that you see here on the Kronos website. Of course, uh, more information on WebGL can be found at kronos.org forward slash WebGL. Uh, and feel free to email us. Uh, let us know if you're working on something that's very exciting, you want to share a project or something like that, please reach out. We'd love to hear from our community and see what you're working on. So again, uh, all these slides will be made available online. Big thank you, all of our speakers.